today I'm going to keep it short and sweet, or at least I'm going to try to. Um, I've got a family meeting that I need to chair that you're invited to. If you're wondering if you're family, you are. The answer is yes, <laughs> you are family. So your attendance is required, please. Uh, we've got some housekeeping to do uh, here at home. And uh, I give you a cursory overview of my thoughts regarding Bill C-4. Uh, in Canada that uh, came into effect recently, I believe on the 8th of January, uh, but earlier this month, and it's been making the rounds on uh, my pages, I guess. Um, and so I've been seeing it in the news. I've been reading articles about it. I actually read the actual, uh, the bill as well. So just thoughts around the whole thing. Uh, this is the bill, if you don't know. Um, that essentially people say it outlaws uh, Christianity, Christian, Christian teaching, Christian doctrine. In fact, a lot of the, in fact, the, the whole canon of Abrahamic religious doctrine um, would be outlawed um, if that argument is true. So we assess that and, and all of that a little bit later on. Um, and of course, I give you free stuff, of course, free stuff. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. As you can see, I'm already quite excited. Leave me your thoughts in the comment section, please. And I'm at Lele Mutadi underscore on Twitter and on Instagram. So connect with me whichever way you wish. Uh, let's jump into it without any further ado. Welcome. So I had a bit of a moment earlier on um, today where I was really emotional and my voice is kind of <laughs> shaking and cracking now uh, as I think about it, but um, where I was just thinking about how faithful God has been, um, particularly with regards to the to the podcast, because um, I I couldn't even remember whether we were the, whether I would be recording episode twenty three or twenty four today, um, and so that was a weird, strange moment to think what. Could it be 24? And it turns out it actually is 24. Um, but even 23, 10, 24, those are crazy numbers, uh, you know, um, considering where where I started. So anyway, um, that's just been, it's been a lot to take in. And um, I think the one thing that's really jarring uh, would be the, um, the level of vulnerability, right? Um, I'm very exposed <laughs> on the podcast, or at least on the platform, right? I'm very exposed. I realize that in conversations with people now, I'm, um, I'm engaging with people who listen to the content, right? So who listen to the podcast. And now this, this is twofold, right? So on the one hand, I enjoy the feedback. I love to hear what people think about the topics and uh, how I put things together. I love to hear um, the advice. Um, I get a lot of advice. I get a, um, just a lot of input. Um, I get people suggesting things and I love that. I love to hear that feedback, which is why I'm always asking you to leave some of the comments, please. <laughs> uh, it would make me really happy. Um, but so, yeah, so on the one side, there's that. Um, and then on the other side, um, I'm also finding that I can't really um, have my personality unfold to people in real life, so to speak, uh, the way that I would like or the way that I'm used to, right? So um, I'm used to being able to set the pace in terms of what people know about me um, in my real life. Um, and usually my walls are significantly high. Uh, so it takes a while for me to open up and things like that. But now, I'm at a point where people know things about me <laughs> um, and I'm like, hang on. And I'm like, oh, of course. Yes, I did speak about that. You know, so it's um, it's like, yeah, it's very strange. Uh, I, I do feel sometimes that it makes me vulnerable because I feel like I'm on the back foot um, because I don't know as much about people. You know, people aren't really because um, I share a lot of personal things i get very honest on the podcast so yeah it, it does it does seem a, a a little unfair uh to my flesh but um it's growth and i love it and pardon me i'm so grateful um so but if you please if you need any more incentive um i i really really would appreciate the feedback um it does help me grow as well and it helps the podcast 
On that note, if you were absent for the previous sitting, that would be By God, episode 23. Please check that out. I stick, sink my teeth into that uh, debate, that conversation in the ANC and really just in the country around the rule of law recently that was sparked by um, that opinion piece uh, and open letter by Umamulindiwe and the responses, um, particularly the response from uh, Minister Lamola in the ANC as well. He came out quite strongly uh, around that. Um, and yeah, I just give my thoughts around around those ANC, um, not, not even ANC politics particularly, in fact, which is why I just wanted to give concluding remarks on this, because I do acknowledge um, the, the, the factional battles um, angle, right? Thank you so much for your patience. I do acknowledge the factional battles um, perspective, right? I acknowledge that the NEC is around the corner and all that jazz. Um, but I still think that whether or not I want to get into those politics um, about the run up to the NEC and you know the yeah, the internal battles essentially, I think that the discussion is still rich, right, and valuable for us to evaluate because it's still worth knowing what what motivates the people who govern the country, the people uh, who make the law, the people who are in charge of executing the law. Um, so yeah, it, it, it really, um, it's worth reflection, okay? And on this one, here's what I see, right? Um, and this, is a, this was prompted by something I heard uh, Tom Sowell say, uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell, I do reference uh, the man a lot. He's an incredible thinker. Uh, if you've never encountered some of his stuff, you, I would, I would definitely recommend that. But so something he said, uh, and and that was, um, I wonder if I'll get it verbatim. I'll try. He said, "People who think um, that they can change the world are infinitely more dangerous than mere crooked politicians." Um, and I would say this not with reference, uh, not in reference to Lamula versus Susulu, but I would say in reference, with reference to um, the ANC's uh, RETs, so the ANC's radicals, uh, versus the EFF, right? Versus the very extreme left, right? Um, so mere crooked politicians, people like Lindiwa Susulu who've been um, accused a very prominent uh, um, critique against her piece uh, was that uh, she was praising the constitution and the rule of law just only recently, you know? Um, so people like that, people who, who, who change sides as the, you know, who just see where the political winds are blowing and that's the way that they go on this day and, you know, people like that, they're less dangerous than people who actually think that they can change the world. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's a consideration. That's something to think about. Uh, uh, check that out. Check out episode 23. But I think I'm going to leave my thoughts on that um, just right there. So if you want me to dig into that um, some more, just, just let me know about that. And I'll consider doing that when I see you again on Monday uh, or at least early next week, but hopefully Monday. Uh, so God's been amazing with the podcast and that's why we need the family meeting, right? So I said, I mentioned that I've been getting feedback uh, from people uh, about the podcast and I'm thinking, so I, there's, there's something happening on the 1st of March. I want you to note that date down, please. Uh, on the 1st of March, if you're a friend of the show uh, or if you're family, um, do keep an eye out um, for what will be happening on the channel around that time and on that date. Uh, but so my, my main concern is how the two mediums are working. I need to know that, please. Personally, I've been, I haven't been enjoying the audio um, since we've been working with the two mediums, which is bizarre because it's actually worse um, before uh, I work on it, right? So that's strange that I would be so not in favor 
of it but that's definitely an area for improvement also if you've got any tips on that please <laughs> um how can i fix that so yeah let me know um but so feedback on that please how was that is it easier to consume do you enjoy the two platforms should i just stick to the one mm, how's that going um i'll consider those and pray about those and um and move as the king of the universe dictates but also in terms of in terms of episode features right so uh these are things like uh free stuff and uh things like earlier on i had i had someone remind me uh, earlier this week oh my goodness i'm getting excited just thinking about it <laughs> i had someone remind me earlier this week about fofo masalisane oh my goodness oh my goodness that i love that segment <laughs> I really love that segment. So that was a segment earlier uh, earlier on in the podcast where I would do I I give four points, right? Um of content essentially, something old, something new, something culture and something true. Uh and I really enjoyed that. That was very like stimulating for me to uh to prepare for and to work on. Um it did become very challenging just in terms of delivery and the length as well. Uh, but if you enjoy that, and if you've got suggestions about uh, maybe how you would we could break that up, something old, something new, on one side, something you know, but just just leave me thoughts about uh, features you would like to see coming back, uh, and we can see how we can make it work for everyone. I do care that you enjoy the show, and I had uh, also feedback about free stuff. Um, so I had a comment about free stuff as well. Um, so that was yeah. So the features. Let me know what you think about the features uh, and suggest anything that you would like to see me do. Um, it won't be written in stone. I will have to consult um, the sovereign. But, you know, I, I, I care. I want your input. So I'm speaking today about, or at least I'm giving you my thoughts around uh, B, uh, Bill C4. Um, that's the Canadian legislation that was passed recently, I believe on the 8th of January. And this is essentially um, legislation that um, it, it amends the criminal code by well, with relation to conversion therapy, right? And that sounds, on the face of it, um, like something that everyone would be in favor for. Like conversion therapy is coercive um, usually, right? So that's how we've come to understand it kind of socially uh, the social consensus is that we don't want to force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do um you know we don't want to do any force anyone to do anything that's harmful you know that's going to um that's going to hurt them in any way undermine their dignity you know what i mean like we conversion therapy sounds really hectic the way that we've learned about it as a people and any any sane person would be like no don't force people to do anything really um you know particularly with regards to their sexuality um but you would need to be moving very fast because if you spend at least two seconds looking at that carefully uh you might wonder what is meant by conversion therapy right and if you do that you're in for a treat. So this is where the contention comes. Conversion therapy, according to, I think this is in um, 301.101. Uh, don't quote me on that. Or is it 131.1? I don't know. It's, 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 re it's really weird um, thingies, sectionings. Uh, but so it, the definition of the that's that's the section I'm just trying to remember the section in the in the actual legislation where the definition is. But I mean it's there you can find it, um, and I'll link that that um, that bill C four in the description as well for you for your convenience, if you want to take a look at that. It's not too long. It's like it's a few pages. Trust me, <laughs> um, and it's just worth taking a look at you know and engaging. I always think it's worth it. You know I can't believe it took me um, getting into law school to engage with not just things like legislation but actual like judgments like case law like this is actually out there you know legislation is out there i i 
was able to download Bill C4. This is Canadian legislation that is sent in only recently. I can engage with that, you know. Um, so yeah, I would encourage that. Just look, just look at it, you know, just to say you did it if you have to. So yeah, I'll I'll put that for you in the in the description. And if you do, you'll see that the definition uh, becomes quite problematic. Because it seems, um, and the first time I heard about this was on my favorite podcast, The Matt Walsh Show, <laughs> which is weird. It's so weird, but I love Matt Walsh. Uh, but so he, he, he raised the point that it obviously, right, and if you, just, if you just read through it, it's blatant. It runs in one direction. Um, so it basically outlaws conversion therapy from gender fluid, gender non-conforming, non-cisgender, transgender, that, you know, gender non-conforming, essentially, uh, group uh, to the heterosexual um, group, right? So you can't make the move this way, but you can make the move that way. So there's nothing against indoctrination and teaching and promulgating ideas around gender fluidity and transgenderism um, and um, non-binary ideology, you know, that that's not problematic. They make it a point, the language makes it a point to be specific, right, about this is what we don't want. This is what we don't want you teaching, right? And the point here, guys, um, is, and a lot of people say this about, you know, particularly about issues like transgenderism. Uh, they say, well, why do you care so much? Um, and this is the case a lot with a lot of uh, uh, what are called lukewarm Christians. Um, and this is not, that term doesn't refer to people who, um, you know, believe in God and sin. That's not lukewarm. I would say lukewarm is someone who denies or is, um, acquiesces to, you um, the, the social truths, right, um, over biblical truths. So people who will deny what the Bible says around homosexual, homosexuality, who will deny what the Bible says about uh, sex before marriage. So it's one thing, and I, I've said this before on the podcast, it's one thing for you to contend, right, with the truth of knowing that that is the standard and you falling short of the standard. That is one thing. But it's another thing for you to give in and say, well, the Bible is unclear on homosexuality. No, it isn't. The Bible is not unclear on that. It's not unclear on the issue of gender, right? Um, the Bible is not unclear on the issue of um, fornication, you know? So I just, something about it, I think, um, and this is not to, I, I don't want to like, sound like I'm beating my chest around this. I'm definitely no better than the next person. But I think there's something about that, and which is why that lukewarm phrase comes in, you know? I think there's something about that for me that's very scary uh, because you're, you're basically, um, you're relinquishing truth, right? You're relinquishing your stake, essentially, in truth. You have a stake in truth right and you need to understand that you have to fight for truth okay so um it's difficult it's very difficult and if, especially for someone like me who was very vocal when i really believed some of these things you know so i wasn't just i wasn't just nodding along no i was arguing the points you know i was defending the side so you can imagine what it what it has might have been like right or might have what it has been well what what it may have what it must have what it must have been like so you know what i'm trying to say okay uh you can imagine what it's been like there we go <laughs> thank you god <laughs> you can imagine what it's been like for me to be able to come on you know public platforms and literally oppose those positions right um openly and be vocal about it and be willing to argue the point. Uh, so, but I think that's, you know, I'm, uh, not everyone has to do it like me, but I think don't deny what the Bible says, 
you know um don't take for granted and i mean people usually get away with it but don't take for granted that people actually read the bible um because there are a lot of uh, you know people who care about uh, fidelity to scripture who do um open the bible and read the bible and who know like th this isn't coming from nowhere you know what do you mean it's unclear i don't know okay sorry you can you can see i'm passionate about that issue um so pray for me please <laughs> Pray for my peace regarding that issue, um, but it does. So that's the phrase. The, that's the phrase on on lukewarm Christianity. And so, but but the the issue about this, uh, why do you care so much? Um, and the and the lukewarm Christi Christians giving up that truth is that it matters, right? The reason I care is this isn't a, a an issue about being polite, right? And 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 just calling you by whatever pronouns you like and acknowledging and affirming your your self-identity this is not what that's about it's not about being kind um it's not about being um amicable or amiable that's not what this is about this is about truth right and in fact and i've dug into this in the in the podcast before but it's 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 more loving right on the side of opposing the lie you know um and this is the discussion i always have regarding that emperor's new clothes right it's essentially become a, an, a running parable on the podcast but but that's the that's that that's the idea it's not loving to affirm a lie um and so that's that's even another reason you know on top of the fact that well you know it's it's it doesn't make sense just you know, in terms of raising children this way, in terms of building societies this way, there is a reason um, we've been able to sustain ourselves the way that we have. There, there's a reason some of these um, conventions and constraints are in place, right? There is a reason traditions exist. Um, there is a reason precedent exists. So for you to try to chuck out the whole of history i don't know it's a bit wild um and so yeah so we do care at least i care you as you can hear <laughs> as is quite evident i i care about truth but also uh and and mac makes this point uh really well he's he he argues that well but you want us to care right you want us to care uh, you're just not happy that we're not caring in the way that you would like, right? So because we're not caring in, in the sense of affirming you, we're not uh, allowing ourselves to be, um, he uses the word bullied into uh, a certain kind of thinking and ideology. Now you're, you're worrying, right? Now you're asking, well, why do you even care so much? You just need to, you know, what, what's it got to do with you? You know, well, you actually, when you say that I must celebrate someone for something, you know, it's one thing for, for you to say, well, to each their own, don't look at what I'm doing on in, in my yard. But when you say I must celebrate someone, affirm them, you know, I must make adjustments in my life and what I consider to be true, you know, um, it, it, for the sake of their self-identity and that I'm actually harming them if I don't, you know, that's... Yeah. You know that's that's something else now i have to actually consider the the merit of what you're saying and so now you have to contend with the fact that i will oppose it if i if i don't think that there's any merit to what you're saying so that was uh, that was a very long tangent i say this to say um that there's a lot of hypocrisy um in that question of why people care so much about the trans issue because this is an, a, a very um it's 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 a very pervasive argument it's used it's thrown around everywhere used against matt walsh a lot used against jk rowling a lot of course we care essentially is all i'm saying please pray for my peace <laughs> um so Bill, Bill C4 gets very problematic in terms of definitions and it's not clear yet. So this is, it's, this is not something that's unusual um, in law that you would have 
it's uh, a, 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 a legislation, a piece of legislation that's um, a little vague in terms of its limitations and sometimes even in terms of its application uh, because so that the so that 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 could be an issue that's resolved in adjudication right so that's not something that's uncommon in law and i think that's the case in this legislation and that's what makes a lot of people uncomfortable right because not only is your definition problematic okay a but b you also don't get into specifics uh, particularly as it relates to parents, to pastors, to counselors, you know. Um, so that's the point. Have you outlawed Christianity? Can a pastor stand in front of the church at the pulpit and preach? Genesis 127, you know, and the litany of scriptures that there are, you know, in the Bible uh, regarding man being sexually dimorphic, right? Man being made in the image of God, male and female, right? And I, when I say the issue, when I, when I make the point about, about uh, gender, and sex, you see this, even this idea of sex and gender, you see, I think that's, you, you don't give them an inch, because if you give them an inch, they'll take the mile. You, you cannot afford to give that distinction between sex and gender. Once you concede that sex and gender are, can be mutually exclusive, right? And that's how they get you. They, they go, well, not always, but sometimes, you know, they're not the same thing. They can be the same thing, but they're not always the same. Like you could, your sex and gender could line up, but not always. Don't give that. You don't give that. Where did we learn that? Where did we get that? Where, do, where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say, right, that man and woman is different from male and female that it's that's never happened ever like in history before like a hundred years ago so we've been around for quite some time like longer than that you know what i mean um that's a very new and very radical idea and that's the point that i'm making right when i say when i point out that it's a genesis one issue I'm not trying to be flippant and say, well, um, this is the first chapter of the Bible. You know, you should know this by now. I'm literally saying this is a fundamental issue, right? This is an issue that is literally at the crux of the creation of man, you know? So if anything else is to be true, literally at all at this point, because this is how primary this issue is, right? Um, it's literally the creation of man. So if anything that follows is to be true, this issue needs to be sorted out, you know? So you absolutely cannot give this issue. You absolutely have to contend, right, for the faith on this issue, okay? You, 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 you cannot afford to be lukewarm on this issue. So, but now what does it mean for pastors who will be preaching Genesis 1.27? at the pulpit for parents who will be teaching their children um what the what the bible's perspective is on this issue um counselors i mean there was an an article i was reading um just in the in the in the in the little bit before i started filming um that spoke about someone who as uh, someone or other who was being interviewed for the article who had an experience in a well, well not in a conversion a camp or anything but uh, with a with an ex-gay, and I'm trying to quote verbatim here, an ex-gay Christian therapist, right? Um, and his family forced him, I think it's actually Michael Quack, Quag, Quag, I don't know, Canadian surnames really get quite inventive, hey? <laughs> but yeah, Mr. Mr. Quag, um, he's now 37, well, at the writing of this article 
He said that when he was 19, his family forced him to uh, to see an ex-gay Christian therapist. And he that that experience was so um, terrible for him, essentially. Uh, he, he said it was dehumanizing, it was so bad that he almost took his life over it, right? So that's how awful this person felt. That's how deep in darkness um, this person was over this issue. Um, so, but is that right? You know, is it right to say that, um, because think about it, um, the, Mr. Quag concedes that it wasn't, the, the, he wasn't ingesting something because conversion therapy can sometimes be hormonal or, or medical procedures or, and shock therapy and all that gruesome stuff. But so he concedes that that wasn't the case, right, in, in his instance. So he says, well, no, it was just, you know, like regular therapy sessions, but with an ex-gay Christian therapist, right? So an ex-gay Christian therapist in obviously his working title, you know, the fact that he's known as an ex-gay Christian therapist tells you the kind of, you know, ideas that you would probably be encountering in, you know, in his room. So, yeah, that to me seems like a loving thing for his family to do, right? So they're not, um, they're acknowledging, right, the reality. They're acknowledging the truth um, that their son does have homosexual uh, urges um, and they, I would say, even um, make a good effort to respect um, that fact. You know, they don't try to imagine that they can just beat it out of him. They don't try to imagine that they can just, you know, just scold him once about it and tell him to, you know, just get a girlfriend or whatever or tell him he's going through a phase. They actually take it seriously. They get him an ex-gay uh, Christian counselor, you know. They try to tailor it to his, his situation, right? And they, they ensure that this is not going to be someone who's going to put their son through any medical procedure. This is someone who's going to equip our, our son with the tools. And this is the thing. <laughs> like, he acknowledges all of this. So when you think about it, for me, I was like, well, what actually is wrong with that, though? I mean, I hate that you hated it, you know? Um, I hate that it was an, an experience that for you, um, you, you, want, you almost took your life over that. And I'm grateful you didn't. Uh, but I, I have a few questions for you on the lessons that you took out of that. Because you seem to have learned a lot from that situation, but um, not, not, the, not the lessons... <laughs> not the lesson you should have learned there um so yeah you but yeah well that's that's my point on that is that nothing about it is wrong right there's no wrongfulness so there's no fault okay um so for you to say it was a, 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 particularly in the context of trying to help you, like for you to say it was dehumanized, and I can understand not wanting to do it, but think about the kinds of things that are dehumanizing. You know what I mean? Slavery, dehumanizing. Particularly when you get into the realm of, and no slavery is good, but like sex slavery, absolutely dehumanizing. So, I mean, I don't mean to try to equivocate and pain is different. We can never, you know, obviously it's, it's what he felt at the time is valid and still feels now um, is valid, but I will take him up on the truth. And so the ex-gay Christian counselor hasn't on based off of your own arguments. And I presume you gave me the best arguments, surely that you had, right, to argue this point. This is something that happened when you were 19. So if from your own, the best arguments you had available on your end, if I don't see any wrongfulness, any fault from the best points that you had, yeah, we've, we need to have a little bit of a conversation there. 
Um, so a lot of people are quite up in arms about this, but not enough people. I think a lot of people on my scene, on my radar, only because of the content that I consume, uh, you know, uh, they've been talking about it quite a lot. I read, I read a piece by the, the Gospel Coalition, uh, who've also been quite wishy-washy on the trans issue um, in recent times. But one of their um, one of their reverends wrote on this, and you know it was it was very sound. Um, I I actually yeah I liked the the approach that he took on that on that piece. I'll just get in his name. I don't want to leave him unnamed. So reference uh, reference. Pardon me, Reverend. <laughs> I'm referencing the reverend. Of course, it makes sense. That's how that's how that happened. But so this is Reverend Paul Carter on the article penned on well published on the third of January. I'll leave everything in the description. But so those are my thoughts, just um, kind of on the face of uh, those facts about the legislation and just. Um, reading up on on responses and articles and pieces written uh, after that that legislation is centered it wasn't the first attempt so I believe there have been three there were there were two attempts before and the second one um, that that kind of reached its end in around August of 2020 I believe uh, that one was stifled by an election um, and then in the in the 44th um, Parliament this one assented, right? So um, if, if not the 43rd, I think the, it's probably the 44th, um, if, if my memory serves me. Um, so, so now, finally, it's been, it's, it's, it's got, it's got, it's give, been given the royal assent, uh, which means that essentially it's been voted through, it's been sanctioned by the House of Commons, by the Senate, and by the Sovereign. Um, and essentially it's law, you know, it's Canadian law. Uh, Canadian federal law, not just provincial, not local. So it actually governs the whole country. Um, so it's quite serious stuff, I think, particularly with so many questions up in the air um, about its application, about its scope, really, um, about why that language is so blatantly anti-heterosexual. I think it's one thing, and this is the point, it's one thing to not be um, to not have a position to be to try to be absolutely neutral, I would argue that that's impossible. But it's one thing to 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 claim that position, to try to hold that position, and it's another thing to outwardly say um, we are going to criminalize um, the, particularly when you get into the language, right? They say anything that represses um, uh, uh, someone's gender identity. Can you imagine the kinds of things that could count as something that represses my gender identity, right? Or the gender identity of someone who's trans, much less, you know, that's, that could be, that could be anything, you know, that could be anything. If I feel my gender identity is being repressed and I, and I can argue that, and which is why we have to wait for this to get to court, right? This is why we actually have to see this being adjudicated. Let's see what the application actually looks like in Canadian courts. Let's see the judiciary actually engage with this legislation, right? Let's see if, how, if, if they're going to have a fun time with this, right? If they're going to um, limit it in any way, which limitations they're going to, to put in order. Um, there have been uh, legal minds also who've been writing pieces on this, um, and they they've essentially the, they they um, they they project that uh, it'll probably be the case um, that it'll have to be either amended or um, they'll it'll just have to go to court for us to see how it plays out. But as I said earlier on, it's not unusual for, for legislation to be a bit vague sometimes just to give that the, the judiciary um, the, the, the room to adjudicate essentially and to do its job in terms of application. But there's definitely, there, there's, there is a point of no return, right? There's, there's such a thing as too much power in the judiciary. And this, funny enough, is 
a beautiful circle <laughs> um, to the conversation we were having last week about the rule of law and the judiciary and conflating the role of the judiciary and the roles of the judiciary and the legislature and even the executive actually because that's a very important part that Minister Sisulu was forgetting somehow and that Minister Labona actually had a better grasp of. I think that might just be because um, he he's actually he works with you know the judiciary, so he probably would know um, more about that. Uh, and with obviously his legal education and just his legal experience, uh, so. I don't want to, I could go on, I could, uh, but I've kept you here for long enough, I'm so sorry, let's jump into free stuff, I do apologize, leave me your thoughts please, <laughs> leave me your thoughts, I can get carried away, I'm sorry, um, leave me your thoughts in the comments, and I'll be uh, ready to engage with those, free stuff, let's go. <laughs> actually quite shameful how I began the show <laughs> with any intention of keeping it short. Uh, or at least any purported intention. No shame, I really, I did intend. I, I didn't intend to be so fired up and carried away, but I should have definitely known better. So, um, but it's always a fun time. Leave me your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you so much in advance. Free stuff uh, today is actually coming from uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And if it sounds to you like, I have been reading this book a lot. Uh, I promise you that's only because I have. So I can't stop reading and rereading uh, chapters in here. You know, I think um, it's probably the writing with just how simple it is. And the I think the depth of the ideas uh, that C.S. Lewis is able to go into um, in the simplicity, right? of the words he uses um, can be very misleading. I always find that I have to read a few times um, and it's really, it's beautiful to read. It's beautiful to witness, right? To experience that um, because he, he, he's so simple. You know, he's got a, he, he's just erudite. If there's, if there's ever been anyone I knew to, to be clear um, and have just have a really good knack for diction, you know, and for and for teaching, um, and meditation on very complex issues. C.S. Lewis is a very great mind, but I'm sure a lot of people already knew that. Uh, but so free stuff from C.S. Lewis, courtesy of the great, uh, the late great C.S. Lewis is um, a, a point he made in Mere Christianity in the chapter about faith. He's got two chapters about faith. This isn't the first one. Um, I was reading this, I was reflecting on this yesterday and it came, it came, it came together in a very, yeah, in a very dramatic way, actually, um, come to think of it. And sometimes God is just like that. But I was, I was reading up on, on this, um, chapter on faith again and I was really caught by the idea that faith and reason um, have an integral link right um, faith is on the same side as reason and for me that was a very refreshing idea because the debate always seems to be between faith and reason, right? That's how we come to understand the debate between Christians and atheists in like contemporary discourse, right? In popular contemporary discourse. That's how we come to understand uh, the positions, right? On, 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 on this discussion. And that's not necessarily the case. And C.S. Lewis does a spectacular job he's literally it's sublime right he does such a great job in actually making it plain and i'm gonna i'm gonna read that for you so you can just see what i'm talking about it's so beautiful so he says now faith in the sense in which i'm here using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods 
right? So that would be our free stuff. Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. He continues, for moods will change whatever view your reason takes. I know that by experience. That is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist, but just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. <laughs> Consequently, he says, one must train the habit of faith, right? Uh, unquote. So, <laughs> a master with words, I tell you. Um, but that's the idea. So that link between faith and reason and being able to um, make the habit and, and exercise the muscle of faith um, and, 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 yeah, basically train yourself, discipline yourself um, into faith, right, because of reason. And the argument he makes, so he, makes a, he gives a few examples of this. Um, he, he makes an example of uh, a boy drowning, a little boy um, being afraid in the water that he's going to drown, even though he's seen countless times people swimming and he's seen that um, a human body um, in a body of water, it won't necessarily just drop down to the bottom, right? Um, it's able to, the human bodies are able to float on water. Uh, but that's the, the irrationality of the fear and the imaginations and what, what if this and what if that, that's what comes in the way. So that's what's actually challenging the faith. Reason and faith are not in contention here, right? They're not in conflict. Reason and faith are on the same side against moods and imaginations, okay? That's the argument. Um, and... You know, it, that was one thing to um, to try to eat into yesterday, um, and and I had a uh, yeah I had a very difficult time wrapping my head around that because I I was really mind blown uh, by that. But then today today I uh, I was reading Mark Mark sixteen fifteen in I was reading Mark uh, sixteen fifteen. And it, it, just for context, this is now uh, uh, Christ has died, he's been crucified, he died. And now the disciples are in a room. Essentially, they've, some of them have denied. So uh, Mary Magdalene has seen Christ at this point. So he rose, he's risen from the dead. And, um, and, and some of the disciples are being told. Now word is going around. It's spreading amongst the disciples that Christ has risen, Christ has risen. And some of them are like, no, there's no way. What are you talking about? You know, but not only that, some of them have denied him. You know, they were they were denying him. Some of them, like, it's just a tough time. They're grieving, they're mourning. You know, it's a hectic time for them. So they're essentially in hiding, sort of, um, uh, from from the world. They're very disoriented at this at this point in time, and they don't know what to believe. They don't know what to do. You essentially you see that imagination, the moods coming up, right? The mood of grief and of loss and of fear and of um you know kind of um confusion and loss right mm, that comes up against reason um and where does the reason kick in in the scripture in um i believe it isn't actually in verse 15 itself is is jesus came to them and he said go out and preach the gospel to all of creation, right? So he continues, he basically, he rebukes them. He's like, why have you guys not be, been believing? Like, what are, you, what are you guys doing, actually? <laughs> what have you guys been doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Since I was crucified. Like, what, what's happening with you guys? Get yourself, get yourselves together, pull yourselves together, and go and preach the gospel. This is something that you know. You, like, why are you butting heads, why are you confused, running around in circles, not knowing whether you're coming or going, you're not, you're not even believing that I've risen, didn't I tell you this? Go and preach the gospel to all of creation. Simple as that, right? I don't have time for, you know, to, to sit around and, and wait for you to bring it together again, right? Because we've been through this, okay? That was the whole point of my ministry with you, my whole time with you, right? That, that's the reason part. 
you've seen the evidence, you've assessed it, you've evaluated this. This is something that you've asked the questions. You know what I mean? You've, you've grappled with the material. Okay, so your reason knows that right now the gospel needs to be preached. Right now, everything that scripture said would happen has happened. Everything Christ said would happen, ha ha would happen has happened. Um, and so all there is, is to preach the gospel to all creation. So Christ comes in and he basically, of course, as he does, you know, he takes matters, you know, into his very capable hands. And he says, you know what, listen, this is what you need. I'm going to give you direction. You need to go and preach the gospel. Okay, not what you're doing. Not this thing that you're, you're trying to do here. The weeping and all of that, appreciate it. But the point is the gospel. That's what's going to save lives. That's, go that's what's going to win the souls. Um, and that, that idea of doing what is immediately in conflict with your fear, you know, with your pain, uh, with your anxiety, with your pride even, with your sense of safety, with your sense of control, doing what is immediately in conflict, in conflict with it, in that moment, that's what you need to exercise. So that habit of, of remembering, remaining in the awareness that um, God is God, God is sovereign, he created everything, um, he's very much in charge, um, he says so, and I need to do the best that I can to live my life in accordance with his will. How do I know what his will is? Oh, I've got the Bible for that, right? So I can find out what he said in the Bible, right? And um, that's not always a very difficult thing to do, right? So, and I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't recommend independent studying of the Bible. Uh, I've tried different uh, types. I've tried to study it independently and I've tried to do it with, you know, supplemented with other readings and other, um, you know, writings from other people and teachings from other people and, and that. And I would definitely recommend the latter, right? So I would definitely say, um, get as much information, pull in as much information as possible when you're trying to um, piece together scripture yourself, right? It's, it, particularly if you're someone who wants to make make up your own mind about things uh, and you don't want to be dependent on a preacher um, and you're not too sure what the Bible actually does say about homosexuality so and you want to you wanna know, you know? Um, I would say don't just sit down with your Bible, uh, you know, on your own one afternoon and try to and expect to find the answer that easily. It could be that, that easy, um, but, you know, sometimes, um, and in my experience, most times, it's going to need just a little bit more. And it, sometimes that little bit more is just meditating on that, right? So actually spending time reflecting or writing um, about what you, what you learned or what you read or the meaning, you know, about what, uh, of what you read. Uh, sometimes you, you, you spend weeks on literally one scripture. That's literally happened to me, right? So, um, and every day is a new layer. And some days you feel like um, you're not hearing anything from God. And some days you feel like um, you're not moving any closer to finding any sense of direction um, or getting the answers that you, you feel you really desperately need in that time because you're being overtaken by the moods and the fear and everything. Um, and you're getting caught up in the source, essentially. But that's free stuff. I could here yeah, as well go on. But uh, that's, the, that's the gist of it. I think that that's a very valuable lesson to learn. Can you tell that I like free stuff <laughs> from how long I tend to take with my reflections? I get very carried away uh, because, yeah, these are very, this is, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about these issues. So it's very close to my heart. Uh, I'm hoping that it's enriching for you as well. I'm hoping you have a fun time uh, just uh, musing on some of these uh, issues uh, along with me. I'm hoping to hear some of your musings in the comments section. Uh, or find me at Lele Mukhari underscore. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. Alternatively, you can just find the visuals because I'm on YouTube as well. So go see me. Go look at my face. <laughs> Sounds weird, but that's all it is. It's really just um, 
just the the the, the visuals um, the visual version of me speaking so if you're interested in that at all find that on youtube and um i always leave the link for that in the description for your convenience um, and just let me know what you what you think in terms of not just this uh, previous segment, not just the free stuff and the issue about the link between faith and reason. Had you made that link prior to this episode? Have you read Mere Christianity? What did you make about that uh, section on faith, those two sections actually about faith? Because I think that was for me, um, it was a very refreshing perspective. But don't just leave me your thoughts on that. I also want to hear your thoughts about Bill C4. I want to hear your concluding remarks or ongoing remarks regarding that rule of law discussion with Minister Sisulu and Ronald Lamola. What do you think about that little bit that I threw in uh, when I tried to compare the radicals of the ANC with the radicals of the EFF? Essentially, um, what do you make of that? Uh, do you think, do you see it? Uh, is, do, you, do you see it? Are you, are you convinced at all? Um, and also, of course, other, other, any other issues uh, that I may have spoken about. There's the issue of Britney Spears um, and the conservatorship. Uh, that's also been uh, on my radar. I've been reading up uh, on that as well. If you would like to hear my thoughts on that, let me know. There's also a um, the, the pig transplant. I don't know if you saw any headlines about this, but a, 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 the first ever pig heart, so heart of a pig, transplanted into a human man. Yeah, so that was in the news, and that, that happened. <laughs> you know, that's something that happened recently. Um, and of course, the, the, there were some genetic modifications made on the heart itself. I think it was about 10 or 11 modifications made um, in terms of the size of the heart as well, because usually a pig's hearts uh, grow much larger than human hearts. And, uh, you know, I think for me, not just I, I, I don't want to get caught up in just the spectacle of it all um, and the shock horror. But this raises, I think, a very interesting discussion around where exactly is the seat of consciousness because the heart is a very important um organ in our conception of mankind right um is consciousness in the mind is it in the heart uh what does that mean for the role of the heart really and i know a lot of people when when you refer to the heart you're not talking um about the literal beating organ sometimes you are um, but I understand that there is a metaphorical sense as well or a symbolic sense. But the heart is definitely, this is something there's no question about, distinct from the mind, right? So the heart is, is it anymore an integral role to human consciousness? Um, would we be able to transplant the mind from, from, another, from another animal, uh, a mind that we duly genetically modified in the in the same way that we we did in the case of this heart um would those genetic modifications make it legitimate would it make it right you know if if that's even you know if that's a if that's a question we can we can venture you know about the rightness and wrongness about it but i think even just that 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 very first issue right that that preliminary question about where is the seat of consciousness we could yeah we could dig into that so let me know if you're interested about that in in that at all uh but for now you've been so great for spending a little bit of time with me and for um just giving me your um your, your attention on some of the most important issues that i've isolated um in in our society and in our culture in real time i'm hoping that until next time you're going to breathe very deeply for me please uh drink water and do pray um even if you can't do it always do pray more often than not um it's been a pleasure for me it always is you can tell i enjoy this uh it's, it's always a pleasure for me to spend time with you uh but yeah i've been lele mutari and thanks for joining me stay blessed